Good evening and welcome to our evening worship service here at the Bremen Church of Christ. It's my privilege to lead singing tonight. I beg your indulgence with my voice and I'll ask you to participate in our worship and song this evening. Number 418 will be our first song, 418. <coughs> Prayer number 257. 257. <laughs> After this song, we'll have our prayer. 257. Bye. 
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us. We thank you for this day that we've had to learn more of your word. Pray that everything that has been done today has been in accordance with your will. Pray that you'll be with Brother Chad as he brings us your brings us the lesson shortly. We pray that you'll also be with him in the messages he plans to bring to West Georgia's gospel meeting. Pray, Lord, that you'll be with this congregation. We pray that you'll bless the efforts of its elders, its deacons, its teachers, and others that are putting forth efforts for, for it to grow spiritually and numerically. Pray, Lord, that you'll be with our elected leaders. We pray that you'll give them the courage and wisdom to do that which is pleasing in your sight. Pray, Lord, that you'll watch over those who serve in our armed forces, especially those deployed or stationed in dangerous areas. Pray that you'll also be with those who serve in our law enforcement, our firefighters, and others that protect and serve the people of this land. Pray, Lord, that you'll be with those who are in poor health. Pray that you'll be with the doctors and nurses that are tending to their needs. Pray that you'll be with their families as well. Pray that you'll be with those who have lost loved ones. Comfort them as only as you can. Pray that you'll forgive us when we fail thee and strengthen us when we're confronted with temptation. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to go ahead and mark our invitation song, it's number 71. Number 71. Song before our lesson tonight's number 230. Pay attention especially to the words of this song. They are excellent and quite apropos before our lesson this evening. 2.30. Invite you to stand if you'd like. 2.30. to be here this evening. I want to say again, I sometimes say this and I, I probably say it a lot, but I don't think you can say it too much, how much I appreciate the brethren here, the congregation. You've been so good to us, to our family. The elders have been so good to us and I just, uh, I don't, I don't want to let an opportunity go by to say thank you for that without taking advantage of it. And so I appreciate that. Uh, everybody has just been so wonderful to us, and 
Uh, that, is, uh, that is just such a blessing, and we appreciate that so much. Thinking tonight about adversity, turmoil, suffering, uh, however we may want to put that, we all face it in, in some manner or another. There's not a person on this earth who is immune from adversity. Now, some of you are here tonight, and you're Christians. You're children of God. Some of you are here, and you're not, and you need to become children of God. I, I, I think most people who are in this assembly know how to become a Christian, for the benefit of those who may not, you need to understand that Jesus said, if you believe not that I am, you shall die in your sins, John 8, 24. We must believe that he is the Savior of the world, that there is salvation in no other name under heaven, Acts 4, verse 12. You need to repent, turning your mind. We often talk about repentance as a change of life, but really repentance is a change of mind. It will lead to a change of life. But you may need to repent, turn your mind toward God and decide, I'm giving my life to him. I'm going to bring my life into line with his will. You need to confess his name as Lord. We're told that with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10, 10. You need to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. If you haven't done that, you haven't obeyed that gospel plan of salvation, and, and understanding that when we give that, it's not just a checklist of things that we must do. It is a process by which I give my life to Jesus Christ because he gave his life for me that I might have the hope of heaven. Doing that, having completed that process, I've, I've believed in him, I've, I've turned my mind around and I decided that I want to live for him. I don't want to live for myself anymore. I confess his name before witnesses. I'm buried with him in that watery grave of baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Having done that, now being a Christian, added by the Lord to his church, Acts 2.47, guess what? It doesn't make you immune from adversity. It doesn't make you immune from suffering from the difficulties that life sometimes and many times, it can be very frequent, but it's not going to make you immune from those, those disadvantages and those difficulties that life brings our way. I just want to tell you that up front. I think, again, most of us here understand that, that being a Christian doesn't magically make everything go away. But I will tell you, I have, I have studied with folks. I have seen folks... Be baptized into Christ. Now, I wasn't the one doing the baptizing, but I've seen one. I could tell you by name, somebody that I know right now, that I honestly believe this person obeyed the gospel, thinking it's going to remove all difficulty from my life financially. It's going to remove all adversity from my life. And when it wasn't the bed of roses that this person expected, then they fell away. Becoming a Christian is the right thing to do because it is the right thing to do. Because it's the right thing for eternity, for you to have your soul saved. But understand, it's not going to take away adversity. You may be here tonight and may need to make changes in your life as a Christian. You may need to have a change of mind, repentance, in one area or another. But again, I will tell you up front, it's not going to magically erase adversity from your life. We all face adversity. What do we do with adversity in our lives? That's the question that we want to ask tonight. What confidence can the child of God have in his or her life when it comes to adversity, difficulty, turmoil? That is a valid question because as we said, as we have pointed out, being a Christian, being a faithful Christian doesn't make you immune from it. So what confidence can we have in the face of adversity? Well, let's Notice, first of all, that we can be confident that adversity will come. You can be confident that adversity is going to come in your life. Let's define what we're talking about, first of all. What is adversity? Uh, Webster's definition here for adversity is a state, condition, or instance of serious or continued difficulty. Turmoil, same thing, uh, Webster's Dictionary, a state or condition of extreme confusion, agitation, or commotion. We understand what adversity turmoil is, is difficulties that life brings our way. It can come in any manner of forms. 
they manifest themselves, and that is adversity and turmoil, they manifest themselves in different ways, different, different outlets. But one thing is for sure, adversity will come in our lives. That's one thing. That's one thing you can be confident about, whether you're a child of God or not. Adversity will come. That's just part of, part of living in this old world in which we live. Psalm 90, verse 10, the psalmist says, The days of our years are three score and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. You don't believe adversity will come, just ask Job. Job said in chapter 14, verse 1, Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Poor old Job understood that life sometimes can bring adversity and as the old saying goes, sometimes when it rains, it pours. But we know adversity is going to come. If nothing else, we all have to face the adversity of the devil. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's looking to cause people to lose their souls. So if nothing else, you're going to face that adversity in your life as a child of God. You're going to have to deal with the devil who wants you to be lost. But we know that's not all we have to worry about because adversity, it comes to everybody. Adversity and turmoil, they come to the righteous. We mentioned Job. Job was a faithful. He was so faithful that, that God himself says to Satan, when Satan comes along in Job chapter 1 and says, it's essentially as if Satan says to God, I've got the whole world in my hip pocket. It's almost like, and I'm paraphrasing from Job chapter 1, but when, when Satan is there, it's almost like he says to God, I'm kind of bored down there on earth because <laughs> I got all your people. You, you've created these humans and I've got them all. I mean, they, they make mistakes. They really mess their lives up. And it's kind of making my work pretty easy. But God says, oh, really? Have you considered my servant Job? I don't know about you, but I can't imagine a higher compliment to be paid to me than for God himself to say, have you seen my servant? And to point me out as an example of faithfulness. But that's what he does with Job. Job was a righteous man. You think about David. We know David made his mistakes. He, he made some big mistakes. But in his younger days, before any of that, and not saying that he was sinless in his younger days, but at one point, God actually chose David to be king over Israel. And so Samuel, the prophet, goes, he anoints him. I've got a friend up here, and he's just driving me crazy. Uh, but he sends Samuel, the prophet, to anoint David as king of Israel. And you know what happens after that? David, of course, goes on, he kills Goliath. And Saul is so jealous that he wants to kill David. Well, what did David do wrong? David didn't ask to be king. He didn't aspire to have a coup and overthrow the, the reign of Saul. He just was doing what God told him. Saul tries to kill him, and David ends up on the run. He was suffering, turmoil, but it wasn't through any fault of his own. Think about that great servant of God, Paul the Apostle. Look at all that he went through. Read 2 Corinthians 11, all that he went through, all that he suffered for our Lord. He was a righteous man. I think about Joseph. And all that he suffered, and he stayed faithful to God. I think about Daniel, carried off into a foreign land. He was faithful to God. Here's a man that could have said, well, God's evidently abandoned me. I'm going to go back and, and just, you know, went in Babylon, do as the Babylonians. But he didn't. He stayed faithful. And so adversity and turmoil, they come to the righteous, but let's understand they also come to the unrighteous. Isaiah says in 57, 21, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Proverbs 10, verse 3, The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. We can be confident that adversity and turmoil will confront us. How, how do they do so? How do they confront us? Well, it may be people, it may be events, it may be circumstances. All these things can cause adversity and turmoil in our lives. I think about Jesus in Matthew 16, 1 to 4, dealing with the sign-seeking Jews. They want a sign. Give us a sign. Well, these are people causing adversity in the life of Jesus. There's another example in Mark 3, 5. It says, He looked round on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. 
Well, they were causing him difficulty, and it upset him. Not because he was just angry for no cause, but because of the hardness of their hearts. And, of course, the people who crucified Jesus caused him a great deal of adversity in the events surrounding the crucifixion in Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, John 18 and 19, in those gospel accounts. But let's remember that Jesus left us an example. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4.15. He gave us that example, 1 Peter 2, verse 21. And the thing about adversity is, though we are told over and over again in the Bible that we can expect it, you know and, and I know that it doesn't give us advance warning. It doesn't knock at the door of our lives politely and ask for permission to enter. Adversity, turmoil, they burst through the door, as it were. They can come at the most inconvenient of times. Children don't ask for permission to rebel. Sickness doesn't ask for permission to affect our families. Accidents don't ask for permission to happen. It just happens. What's the child of God to do when we know that we can face adversity in our lives? Number one, we've seen you can be confident adversity will come. But number two, you can be confident that God will come. He's told us so himself. Psalm 37, 25 is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. The psalmist there says, I have been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. That's God essentially saying, I'm going to come. When you're in adversity, when you're in turmoil, I'm going to come. I'm going to be there. Joshua 1, verses 5 and, and 9. God says to Joshua, and we studied this just a few months ago. As I was with Moses, God says, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. He goes on to say, Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Don't be afraid, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. We can be confident that when we go through difficulties, adversity, turmoil, that God is going to come. And in all reality, he's never left if we are faithful children of God. He's, he's there all along. But you can know he's going to come. They that wait upon the Lord, they'll renew their strength, Isaiah 40, verse 31. Mount up with wings like eagles. And most people are familiar with that verse. Hebrews 13, verse 5, the latter part of that verse says, He will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I remember studying this in, in our class in preaching school and one year of Greek class, you just barely get, know enough to be dangerous. But I remember studying this and, and studying the word there in, in Hebrews 13, 5, where it says, it's translated in our English Bibles, never. And studying that and learning that what that word really means, it's so emphatic in the Greek that really the, about the best way to translate it into English would be to say, he had said, I will never, 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 never leave thee nor forsake thee. It is a very emphatic word in the original language and it's driving home the point that God says, I am with you. I'm not going anywhere, God says. He's going to be with us every step of the way. In fact, Isaiah 49, 15, another one of my favorite verses. God asks a question there. He says, can a woman forget her sucking child that, it, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb. Can a mother forget her child? Well, sometimes it happens. We sometimes see that. Mothers abandoning children. But God says at the end of that verse, Yea, they may forget. Yet will I not forget thee. You know what God says in that verse? He says, Your own mother will forget you, will abandon you, before I will. That's the confidence we can have in the face of adversity. And I don't know about you, but that sure makes me feel better to know that. The story was told of two men who were fighting in a war together. They became very close in the time that they spent overseas in these battles. During one particularly fierce battle, this man's best friend was out. He, had, he was out away from the foxhole. They were attacked. He was shot. Against orders from his commanding officer, his friend went out to get him. He said, my buddy's out there. I can't just leave him. 
And the man said, you are a sitting duck. If you get out of this foxhole, you, I am, he says, it is an order. You stay here. Well, he left against the orders. He said, I'm going to get my friend. <clears throat> he went got his friend and he got back, fell with his buddy into the foxhole. The commanding officer said, I tried to tell you, son. He said, now look, you are mortally wounded. You're bleeding out and there's nothing we can do. He said, I tried to tell you. It wasn't worth it. And the young man looked up at him and he said, oh, sir, but it was worth it. You see, when I got to him, he looked up. He was still alive when I got to him. And he looked up at me and our eyes met. And in his dying breath, he said, Jim, I knew you'd come. He said, it absolutely was worth it. When we're in the battlefield of life, as it were, and we're going through tough times, you can know God is going to come. That he's never, he's never left you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. There's an interesting thing about an Indian tribe, a, a particular Indian tribe. They, they had a very unique way of uh, sort of a, a coming of age for the young braves. At the age of 13, on their 13th birthday actually, they would take them out into the woods that night. And he would, they would march him way out into the woods. They would get him to a spot, <clears throat> blindfold him when they took him there. And when they got him there, take off the blindfold, they would leave him about dusk, and they left. And this young man's coming of age, so to speak, was to spend the entire night in the woods by himself, 100% alone. Well, you can imagine... I like to camp out, but I don't like it when, when you're camping out and you wake up in the middle of the night and you hear all these weird noises outside of your tent and you're going, what was that? You know, everything is, everything's a grizzly bear at that time of night. You hear a little twig break and you think, what was that? Was that a wolf? You know, you may hear something howling way off in the distance and you think it's right next to you. And so I can just imagine, and I mean, that's me, a 35-year-old man. I can imagine a 13-year-old boy out in the woods, how long that night must have been. But this young, one young man particularly, he, he went through that process and he sat there and he hardly moved a muscle. And he was just shaking with fear and he'd hear these noises, not knowing what it was. Finally, it began, to, it began to be about daybreak. There began to be just a little bit of light and finally some light starts filtering through the woods and he can see the path where they led him into the woods. But as, as there gets to be more light, he sees something. It was the silhouette of a man. It was his father. Bow and arrow in hand, he had been there the entire night to make sure that his child was safe. Now, when we go through adversity, sometimes it's frightening. Sometimes it's difficult. But let me assure you, let God assure you through his word, he's there. He's right there the whole time. And he's going to make sure to look after his child. That's not going to be some kind of miraculous removal of the threat or the difficulty. But it is a, an assurance that I have that he's with me. He's looking after me. He's taking care of me. The psalmist said in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. That's comforting. To know when I go through adversity, I can even face the valley of the shadow of death because my Lord is with me. He's traveled that road before. He's experienced that road before. And he says, I'm with you every step of the way. He's right there. You can be confident that adversity is going to come in life, but you can also be confident that God will come. He's never moved. In fact, what the saying often goes, if you find that you're far away from God, remember that God hasn't moved. I think I've told you before about the the older couple, and they, they roll up at a stoplight, and 
here comes this young couple up beside him, and the young couple is sitting, the boy's driving, and, and, and his girl, it's a, it's a bench seat, and his girl's scooted way over, close as she can get to him, and he's got his arm around her, and, and the wife looks over her husband, and she says, oh, look at that, honey, you see that young couple, and he, he kind of smiles, says, yeah, and, and she says, I remember when we used to ride like that, and the husband looks at her and smiles, and he says, honey, I haven't moved. But when you find yourself moved away from God, you can rest assured God hasn't moved. We many times move away from God, but God never moves. And so when we find in adversity, difficulty, or even in times of great happiness that we're away from God, I need to draw closer to him. Draw nigh to God, James says, and he will draw nigh to you. But I can be confident that God will come. But number three, we can be confident that blessings will come. Let's understand that despite the adversity and turmoil that life can bring, I can rejoice knowing that God is with me, number one, but also knowing that I can be blessed as a result of that. Blessings can come as a result of adversity. It has been said, and I think this is very true, I don't know the exact percentages are right, but I think there's a lot of truth to it, that life is 10% what happens to you and 10% how you react to what happens to you. No doubt there's a lot of truth in that. There was a man who was sending his son to Hiram College. At that time, uh, James A. Garfield was the president of that college. Brother James A. Garfield. He goes on to become uh, president, but he was a member of the church, as I understand it. But anyway, the man was talking to Mr. Garfield, and, and he, says, he says, look, there's no way my boy can take all this material in anyways. I want him to have a short course. Can we arrange for that? And he was a wealthy fellow, and he thought, you know, he could financially arrange for this. He says, I want my boy to have a short course. Can we arrange for that? And Garfield told him, sure, we can arrange for that. It depends on what you want to make of the boy. He says, when God wants to make an oak, he takes 100 years. But he only takes about a month or two to make a squash. <laughs> Do we want to be solid as an oak, as Christians, as children of God? Or do we want to be squash? <laughs> the big difference there. How do we face adversity? There's, there's no shortcut to get through it. You can't just say, well, I want a short course to get through it. But I can know I can be blessed as a result of that adversity. James 1, verses 2 to 4, James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, endurance in other words. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect, complete, mature, and entire, wanting or lacking nothing. You see, I can rejoice even in difficulties, even in adversity, because it strengthens me. It helps me to grow closer to God. It blesses my life if I use it as such. I read a story one time of a young lady that was coming in to her father, and she was complaining about all the things that she was going through. And, and, and she had faced some, some real serious difficulties in her life. But she was upset about this, and, and as we sometimes tend to do, she was kind of using her dad as a sounding board. And she was fussing to him how she was just about ready to quit and to give up, and her dad was a, a chef, and he says, uh, he says, come with me, honey, let's go into the kitchen. And he takes three pots, and he puts them on burners, and, and he fills them with water, and he turns them on high, and he waits. And he's just looking at her, and there's this awkward silence, and she's just looking at him and saying, what's going on? He says, just wait. Well, the water begins to, to boil, and he takes those pots, and into one pot he puts some carrots. And into another pot he puts some eggs. And in another pot he puts some ground coffee beans. And he lets them sit there for a little bit. The young lady was getting a little bit impatient at this point, as, as you can imagine. And she said, does this have some kind of a point, Dad? He says, just, just hold on. I'm getting there. Finally, he turns them off. Let's them cool down a little bit. He scoops out some carrots. He says, do you see these carrots? He said, they face, they face a serious difficulty. I put them into boiling water. You know, they went in, they were very hard, unrelenting. But now look at them, they're just mush. 
He says, you look at the egg. The eggs went in very fragile, weren't, weren't able to handle much pressure. I put them in boiling water and they came out very hardened on the inside. And he says, you know, sometimes life can do that to us if we're not careful. The adversity that we face will harden us on the inside. Sometimes we can do like the carrots and just become mush, fall apart. But he says the coffee's different. He says, I put the coffee in there, and he scoops some out, and he gives it to her, and he says, try that. She says, that's good coffee. And he says, the difference is the coffee changed the water. The water changed the eggs. The water changed the carrots. But the coffee, it changed the water. And he says, honey, when adversity comes your way, are you going to be a carrot? Are you going to be an egg? Are you going to be like the coffee? You can change your environment. There are some things we can't change, and we understand that. But again, understand that blessings can come as a result of adversity that we face. Now, God's beneficial use of adversity doesn't remove my personal accountability. To get through adversity, I've got to go through adversity. And that's the difficult part about it. It's interesting... I read this and I thought for sure this was one of those silly little things that there's no possible way it's true. And I, I emailed my father-in-law who was fluent in Mandarin Chinese. But I received this email thing that says crisis in Chinese. Of course, Chinese writing is composed many times of, of characters. It looks like chicken scratch to me. But I guess if you know how to do that, you, you, you understand it. But there are two characters that comprise the word crisis. <clears throat> One of those characters represents danger. The other represents opportunity. Isn't that interesting? I thought that's, there's no way that's true. So I emailed Papaw. And I said, Papaw, I need you to verify this. I, I, I've been wanting to, <clears throat> I got this a while back, and I want to use it as an illustration if it's true, but I just got a feeling it's not true. And he emailed me back and he says, oh, ye of little faith, it is true. Danger and opportunity. That's perfect. Every crisis in our lives presents danger. Even in a spiritual sense, we could talk about the danger of falling away in times of crisis. But you know what? There's also great, great, great opportunity to draw closer to God, to, draw, to grow stronger, as a Christian. What opportunities lie within adversity? Well, there are a lot of things we can talk about. Here are just a few. Purification. Psalm 1, 3, and 4, he talks about the man whose, whose trust is in God. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Whatsoever he dooth shall prosper. Also, you, sometimes you've got to go through adversity to establish those deep roots. I love Job 23.10, the last part of that verse. Job says, and poor old Job, he went through some adversity. But do you know what Job says? He says, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job says, I'm going through a lot. <laughs> it ain't easy. It's, it's testing every facet of my being. But Job says, one thing I know, I'm just going to hang on. And when he's tried me, I'm going to come through this like gold. It's going to better me as a person, Job says. I'm going to come out of this better than what I was when I went into this adversity. We can be purified spiritually going through adversity. <clears throat> There's also an inner growth of mind and spirit. When you lift weights or you do a lot of work, you ever wake up the next day and you can't hardly get out of bed? Maybe y'all have trouble with that. I don't ever experience that. <laughs> Sometimes maybe we do a project. Maybe you, uh, I remember it wasn't, it wasn't all that long ago, painting somewhere. Reagan's, I'm going to get in trouble here because the last painting that was done was all done by her. But uh, I have painted once in a while. But sometimes you paint and just that up, man, I had soreness and muscles I didn't even know existed in my body. Maybe, maybe you go running. Maybe you lift weights. But... We understand it's tearing muscle. But to build muscle, you tear muscle. Weightlifters, they lift weights and they tear those muscles and many times they'll drink 
uh, whey or protein or things like that to help rebuild those muscles because when, they're, when they rebuild, they are stronger. They're stronger. So I can, I can grow in mind and spirit in the same way. The Lord's church grew the most under its greatest persecution. Read the book of Acts and see the church growing, growing, growing. I mean, the more they try to stamp it out, the more it grows. Adversity. There are great things that can come out of adversity. One fellow said, I don't remember the exact quote, but he said the blood of the martyrs basically was fertilizer for the seed of the kingdom. Certainly that was the case. The church can never be all that God wants it to be if, if all adversity is taken away. Again, remember what Brother Garfield said. There are no shortcuts. God wants to make a squash, it just takes a short time. But when he makes an oak, it takes a while. Sometimes there's some adversity that we need to go through. We can also have, as a result of adversity, spiritual resilience, fortitude. Again, James 1, 2 to 4. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations because it can build you up. It can strengthen you. I will remember probably to my dying day, Brother Pettus. Brother Pettus was an elder at the Oxford congregation where I grew up going to church. I... I think from the time that I was brought home from the hospital, from the first time I went to a worship service, that, that was probably where my parents were, and I think he was an elder even at that time. He died a few years ago and, and had, a, had a long bout with Alzheimer's. And, but Brother Pettus was a very special man to me it, for, for many reasons. He was just a great man for the church, but uh, he also took me to my first Alabama football game, and he was just a, a very, very loving, very great man. He loved the truth. He loved the church. But I'll, I'll remember so well, just a little boy, and I went up, uh, one of the first times that I was old enough to remember, and he said, hey there, Brother Chad, and he stuck his hand out to shake my hand. And I thought, bless his heart, something is wrong with his hands. And we need to get this guy a doctor or something. I thought I was shaking hands with like 10 grit sandpaper. Well, Brother Pettis was a carpenter. He was a hard working man. And his hands were rough from all that hard work. But they were tough. I've often thought he probably could have like done push-ups on nails with those hands because they were, they were so tough. Resilience, fortitude, the adversity that we go through, it can harden us in the sense of making us not care about the Lord or spiritual things. But if we allow it, it can strengthen us in the sense that the next adversity that comes my way, I'm more prepared for it than I was before I went through something else. I think most of us can look back at times in our lives and think of something that we went through and then something on down the road that we went through and I thought, I think to myself, you know, that first thing that I went through 10 years ago really helped strengthen me for what I'm going through right now. There are blessings that can come through adversity. And then finally, we can be confident in the face of adversity that we will overcome. And as the saying goes, if we overcome, then we get to hear God say, come over into the eternal heavenly home. We can know that no matter what, we will overcome. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Romans 8, verse 37. Philippians 1, Paul says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. We can be confident that we will overcome. Note Romans 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, first of all, he says all things work together for good. That's the good, the bad, and the things in our lives that are just downright ugly. They all work together for good. God doesn't promise he's going to take away adversity and difficulty. He says, I can make it work together for good. And who does it work together? For whom does it work together for good? Well, to those that love God. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You can't separate love for God and obedience. You just can't do it. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke 6, 46. He says in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. 
God can make all things work together, but it's for those that love Him, those that are striving to serve Him and to do His will. Now, that excludes the godless sinner. That excludes the apostate who's turned their backs on their Lord. And it excludes all who refuse to obey God. But for those that are seeking Him on His terms, He says, I can take the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I can work that together for good. But it also says or doesn't say, a time frame. There's no timetable given here. Sometimes it doesn't work out for good in this life. We've known folks that suffer greatly and, and maybe even right to the point that they leave this life. Some, some, some of my own dear friends, I've seen that happen. But God, we need to understand that God doesn't settle all accounts in this life. Jesus said, He that endureth unto the end the same shall be saved, Matthew 10, 22. Jesus said, Revelation 2, 10, the latter part of that verse, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. It doesn't always work out in this life. But the ultimate reward is for all those who finish the course. And he says, you overcome, and you can do it. He says, I'm with you, and you can do it, and you will be blessed for it if you do. He says, you overcome, and you get to come over into heaven and live forever. Not because you've earned it, but because that's the promise that he's made. And when God makes a promise, you can take it to the bank. As we close our thoughts and close our Bibles and, and prepare to close out here, I want to share something with you that, that is very interesting and I think very appropriate here for what we're, what we're looking at and talking about. This was in 1968, October 20th was the exact date, during the Olympics. They were in Mexico City at Olympic Stadium. It's 7 o'clock at night. Closing ceremonies had just been completed. Spectators and athletes are still warm from the euphoria of celebration. They're gathering everything. Everybody's getting ready to leave the stadium. But then the PA announcer asks everybody to remain in their seats. So you can imagine the confusion. Down the boulevard came the whine of police sirens. From their vantage point, many people in the stadium, they could see motorcycles with flashing blue lights and they're encircling someone coming toward the stadium. Whoever it was, he was moving quite slowly. <clears throat> so everyone remained seated to see this last chapter of the Olympics take place. By the time the police escort got to the stadium, the PA announcer said a final marathoner would be making his way into the arena and around the track to the finish line. Well, now people are really confused in the crowd. The last marathoner had come in hours ago. The medals had already been awarded. What on earth had taken this man so long to finish? But the first sign of the runner making his way out of the tunnel and onto the track told the story. Nobody had to ask. It was John Stephen Akwari from Tanzania. He was covered with blood. He hobbled into light. What had happened was he took a terrible fall early in the race. He hit his head, blew out a knee. He endured a trampling before he could get back to his feet. And there he was, 26.2 miles later, stumbling his way to the finish line. The response of the crowd was so overwhelming, it was almost frightening. Everybody rose to their feet. They encouraged in the last few yards of the race with a, with a thundering ovation that far exceeded the one given to the man who several hours earlier had won the gold medal. When he crossed the finish line, he collapsed into the arms of medical personnel who immediately rushed him off to the hospital. And this is what's interesting, because when he finally got to the point where he could be interviewed by the media, they asked him, and you know that everybody had a lot of questions they wanted to ask this man, but the question that was on everybody's mind was, why on earth, when you endure a trampling, you've blown out a knee, you've got a head injury, you have absolutely no chance whatsoever of finishing that race, why do you get up and go knowing it's going to take you literally hours to finish it? Do you know what John Stephen Aquari said? I'll never forget it. He said, my country did not send me 
several thousand miles across the globe to start a race. They sent me to finish. That is so appropriate for us because, as I said, there may be some here that have not obeyed the gospel. No doubt there are some here who need to obey the gospel. You need to be covered by the blood of the Lamb. You need to get in the Christian race. But brothers and sisters in Christ, God Almighty did not send His Son from heaven to this earth to die and suffer and bleed and give Himself on the cross for our sins for you to start a race spiritually. He sent His Son for you to finish. Let's finish the race. Won't you come as we stand and sing? So thankful to Chad for those two fine lessons today, for all of us who had a public part in our worship, for all of our teachers and song leaders who participated in worshiping God with us today. We're thankful for your efforts. For those that are visiting, we're certainly glad you've decided to be with us. I invite you back at your next opportunity, which will be Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for our midweek, midweek Bible study. If you are here this evening, please fill out an attendance card. And Give that to Chad or one of us as you leave so that we may have a depart or a record of your uh, visit with us this evening. Remind you of those that we mentioned this morning on our prayer list. We do have it official that Brother Higley has landed. He is in New Zealand, so he's had a safe trip, but you're certainly reminded to keep him in your prayer. <clears throat> as with uh, Elizabeth Reed, who's recovering at home from some recent surgery, Jim Allen also continuing at home recovering from surgery. You're also asked to remember uh, Sister Duane Broom, this is Ben Broom and Yvonne Allen's mother. Taylor Beth Eccles not feeling well at home. Reba Carroll not feeling well at home. Shirley Johnson, the four-year-old daughter of David and Angela Johnson of Tallapoosa. These are friends of uh, Stephen and Lee Cooper. This four-year-old uh, girl is to have extensive hearing testing at Scottish Rite tomorrow and your prayers requested on her behalf. Are there any others that we should mention? 
The next ladies' Devo will be uh, Thursday, October the 4th. Thursday, October the 4th, 11 o'clock a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Lasagna, salad, breads, and desserts. Please let Joyce know what you'd like to bring. The next area-wide singing is here at this congregation Friday night, this coming Friday night, <coughs> excuse me, September the 28th at 7 p.m. And we'll uh, have finger food fellowship after that so we can host our guests. We'll ask you to prepare those finger foods and have them ready so that we may have a fellowship after our song service this coming area-wide singing Friday night, September the 28th, beginning at 7 p.m. There's a weekend gospel meeting at the Waco Congregation with the James Rogers, the speaker. That's Friday, Saturday, Sunday this weekend coming up. There's a gospel meeting at West Georgia coming up in a couple of weeks, three weeks, uh, October the 14th through the 17th. Brother Chad Dollahite will be the speaker. There's a fall youth retreat at Camp and Gahey October the 5th through the 7th. More information on the bulletin board. Also, if you have interest in helping conduct the Golden Age Banquet, please see Mark and Deborah at your earliest convenience. That will be the first Saturday in November. Is that right, Mark? First Saturday in November. Brothers Keepers Group 1, this is Gary and Jamie's group, will have a meeting Saturday, October the 13th. Saturday, October the 13th at the home of Greg and Gail Woody. Bring chairs and blankets. I'm sure the blankets will come in handy that evening. But that will be Saturday, October the 13th. More details will follow. Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. Once we stand to sing, go through this door, second door on the left, and there will be someone there waiting to serve you. Again, our next service is Wednesday at 7 p.m. We hope to see each other at that time. Have we overlooked anything or need to mention anything else? Our final song is number 267. 267, if you'll stand, we'll sing and be dismissed. <clears throat> Just a few more days to be filled with praise and to tell the old story. Then when twilight falls and the Savior calls, let us go to Him in glory. I'll exchange my cross for a sorry crown where the gates be. Father, we thank you for this day that we've had to come here to worship you. We ask you to bless us this week and everything that we do. We pray that we've worshiped you in an acceptable manner today. We ask you to bless those that are sick and less fortunate and be with them and restore them to their health, if it be thy will. We ask you to bless us and help us to study your word and do your will. Help us to have the faith to know that if we do your will, you'll take care of us. Keep God and direct us, forgive us of our sins, and at last save us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.